experience. And I decided it was going to be far too expensive to go. Uh, but in the end, I went as a, an early bird uh, pensioner. <laughs> and I led two excursions, and it brought down the price. And I, and I got this for free. Now, most people have written in this book one chapter, many, many chapters, Africa's top geological sites. Most of us are very familiar with Southern Africa and not Africa. And I've given a talk on the Western Cape, Dave Reed on the Richtersfeld, and this now you're going to spread your, your wings. But what I want to stress is that, um, is that Sharad wrote seven chapters in, in this one book. So the titles of his are The Ruinzori Mountains of Central Africa. Surreal landscapes of the white desert of Egypt, which came into the video that we saw. The hand of Fatima. The Hogar Tassilis and Tadrat Akakis. Akakis of Algeria and Libya. The Tibesti Massif of Chad and Libya. The natural arches of the Enedi Plateau in northeastern Chad. And the enigmatic Richard structure in Mauritania. This man has been around. So I give you him. Okay, thank you, John, for that introduction. Um, before I start, I just want to uh, gauge uh, where you guys come from. How many of you have been to um, this region in the north that I'm going to talk about, the, uh, the Sahara? Okay. That doesn't tell me anything. It's like how many of you have been to Africa? Because the Sahara is bigger than the coterminous United States of America. You could fit the whole of the 48 states into the Sahara Desert without touching the sides. That's how big the Sahara is. It's the largest desert on Earth. And I'm going to talk to you about several uh, superlatives in terms of the geology of this region. <coughs> So um, six of the chapters uh, that I wrote for that book are dealing with this, with this uh, area. Actually, uh, I think five chapters deal with the Sahara. The Ruanzori Mountains are not part of the Sahara, so that's not uh, part of my talk today. I also talked about the uh, Shimani Mani Mountains and the Mozambique Zimbabwe border. That's also uh, not part of today's topic. But I'm going to talk about several of these uh, regions in the Sahara, which are all geological superlatives, and they all deserve a place among the top geological sites in Africa. Um, but what I want to do, do first is to introduce you to the whole topic of African geology, which is rather complicated. Um, this is a, a map that uh, I put together with my colleagues for that International Geological Congress in Cape Town in 2016. And um, what it shows is the overall structure of, uh, of Africa, and you don't need to know very much about it, except just look at the colors. So the colors here are purples for the very old Archean rocks, older than 2.5 billion years. And uh, the, the sort of reddish colors are of Proterozoic rocks, which are also uh, sort of Precambrian. So what it shows us is that in Africa, there are three main regions where you've got these very old rocks. There's the West African Craton over here, which is divided into two parts. It's uh, the southern part here and this region here, the Ragibat Shield. There is the Central African region, which is called the Congo Craton, and the Southern African area here, which is called the Carp Val Craton, or the Kalahari Craton, rather, which is this large entity here. And these two cratons had collided along a big mobile belt. And then all these other cratons had, had, had also come together uh, during the amalgamation of the Gondwana supercontinent. Now, <clears throat> the, um, the reason I put this up is to show you that uh, there are some controls on the topography of Africa, which are, which are quite interesting and unique to this continent. And we can see that when we look at a, a topographic map of the whole of Africa. And here what we see is that in the green colors, you've got higher uh, topography than in these orange and yellow colors. Um, and you can see straight away that uh, if you look at southern and eastern Africa, it's all very high topographically compared to north and west Africa, which in general is very low. Now, the situation in north Africa and west Africa, especially down here, 
is what you find in most other continents. If you look at the interior of Australia, the interior of North America, away from the mountain belts, the interior of uh, Europe or, or of Siberia, it's all at an elevation of about 500 meters above sea level. And that's the average uh, elevation of all the continents. But when we look at southern Africa, we see that this region here in green is elevated much higher than that. There's an interior plateau, as we know, the great escarpment in South Africa. And we, as we go into the interior, the whole interior of South Africa is a, is a big plateau. But it's not just South Africa. It extends through the whole of Southern Africa and extends towards East Africa. This is known as the um, great African super swell. Now, the reasons for that uh, have been unknown up till fairly recently, and we now think that it's due to a huge plume of hot material rising from the core mantle boundary underneath southern Africa and trending up towards uh, East Africa, where it actually surfaces as the great East African rift system with all its volcanics. Now, this phenomenon is, is due to sort of buoyancy and uplift above a, a hot mantle region. Now, so whenever you've got hot mantle underneath a continent, it's, it tends to cause uplift because of the buoyancy of hot material. Now, when you look at the, uh, the topography of North and West Africa, it's quite different from this broadly elevated plateau in Southern Africa. What we see here is a series of uplifts, which are these green regions here, and I'm going to talk about many of them. There is, firstly, the Atlas Mountains, which I'm not going to talk about, in Morocco to um, Algeria. Then this region in the central Sahara is the Hogar region of Algeria and, Mar and uh, Libya and adjacent regions in Mali and Niger. This I will talk about. Then here we see the Tibesti Mountains in Chad and Libya. Here we see the Enedi Plateau in eastern Chad. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's the Adamawa Mountains in uh, Cameroon uh, and so on. Between these big uplifted regions, you've got large depressions which are major sedimentary basins, like the Chad Basin, the Taudini Basin over here in central Sahara, the Congo Basin in the middle of the Congo Craton, etc. So what we're seeing here is um, a topography that is dominated by swells and basins. So this basin and swell topography is actually unique to Africa. You don't find this on any other continent. Now, um, the reason for that uh, became apparent um, some decades ago when we, we looked at the plate tectonic motion of all the continents. And it turns out that all the other continents are moving at a really steady state with respect to the Earth's, um, say, uh, polar axis of rotation. As a, if you use that as a reference point, all the continents are in motion. And Africa, too, uh, when it broke up from South America, South America moved away from the Atlantic, mid-Atlantic uh, uh, reach over there. And Africa moved out and rotated in an anti-clockwise fashion until about 30 or 40 million years ago, it started colliding with Europe, the southern part of Europe, and that's where the African plates started colliding with a subduction zone to the north, uh, resulting in some of the volcanism we see in Greek islands like Santorini, etc. Now, what happened after that is that for the last 30 million years, the African plate has become stuck. It's been stuck in the same position uh, relative to the Earth's uh, poles of rotation and therefore stuck over the same piece of mantle over the last 30 million years. And what has res that has resulted in uh, a shallow mantle uh, circulation system um, that has developed underneath Africa. So here is a diagram that illustrates that. Here is uh, um, the African topography with all the swells that we see, which are the topographic highs or uplifts which are shown in these dark regions. And the areas in between are the basins which uh, contain sedimentary basins. And this has been modeled in terms of um, the, uh, the upper mantle of the Earth from zero to about 400 kilometers depth. Uh, a series of, of um, convection cells. It's just like if you had a mealy pot with a, mealy, uh, a big pot with a pup growing uh, you know, inside and it's bubbling away, and then you'll, you'll find that it'll, it'll form a kind of convection system. Well, this is happening in the mantle slowly, and so it gets heated up at the bottom, and then this rises, and it forms a swell, and when rain reaches the top of one of these circulation systems, it causes uplift and volcanism as well. And then um, 
When it moves away from these, uh, the apex of these swells, it, it descends down and, it, and drags things down. So there is a basin that's formed uh, where these things uh, go down. So this um, is the African plate divided up into a number of these different cells, which are polygonal. And underneath each one of these, you can imagine a little convection system happening in the mantle underneath. And that has produced this uh, basin and swell topography. And that is the underlying theme of what I'm going to talk to you about today. That means all the examples I'm going to give you of these uh, spectacular landscapes, the underlying reason for that is this basin and swell topography. And all the regions I'm going to talk about are areas that have been uplifted during this, this process. And uh, therefore, there, there used to be a flat lying sandstone region covering this whole area of North Africa and Arabia. But because of this basin and swell topography having happened after that, uh, wherever you have these uplifts, these sandstone cover sequence, Paleozoic sandstones of North Africa have been eroded away. And in some places, they've been completely eroded away, and the basement has been revealed un from underneath, and then intruded by volcanic rocks that are much younger. So this is what uh, we're going to look at. And I'm going to look at this large region here in North Africa, the Sahara, and the underlying, uh, the adjacent uh, region, which is the Sahel. So here you can see in more detail the Saharan region with all its uplifts and the sedimentary basins that are shown in yellow colors, which are covered with uh, young uh, uh, aeolian dunes and things like that. So it's a very vast region. And I'm going to talk about several examples, starting with the Richard structure in Mauritania, then going on to the Hogar uh, in uh, Algeria here and the adjacent part of uh, Libya in the Jebel Akakus. And then I will go on to the uh, talk about the the Besti region in Chad, the Enedi Plateau in uh, here, which is this one here, in, uh, also in northeastern Chad. And then I will go on to the, um, the White Desert in Egypt. And finally, um, I will talk about something that is not part of this whole basin and swell system, but still part of the Sahara. I will end up here in the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia. So. <clears throat> Let us look at the two regions I'm going to talk about, the Sahara, which is the desert. And if you look on this top image, you see that down here in the equatorial part of Africa, it's shown in green colors because this is the area of equatorial rainforest. So this is an area that is uh, humid and has high rainfall, and the Sahara is the largest desert. So somewhere between the high rainfall region and the desert, there has to be a transition. That transition zone is called the Sahel. This is a region of, uh, of sparse rainfall. Uh, you know, the rainfall drops off from this high rainfall region. And in this area here, it's a very sensitive area because of this. Uh, and it's very, uh, very uh, prone to uh, any climate change, uh, etc. It's somewhat like parts of the Kalahari Desert today, which is sort of semi-arid, or maybe the Karoo. OK, so um, now the Sahara Desert as a whole although it's such a large desert, is also very young, geologically speaking, because it's only formed in the Holocene. At the end of the Pleistocene, when the glaciers were melted, uh, there was a major change in the climate. And uh, prior to that, the Sahara was actually quite green. It was humid and green, and uh, lots of animals roamed. It had a kind of a savanna-type environment. And uh, we see evidence of that left behind by the humans who lived there in the Neolithic. They have left behind abundant testimony in each of these mountainous regions. There are thousands of engravings and rock paintings that show uh, a variety of animals uh, that today are only found in the savanna regions of East Africa. Things like giraffe and elephants, and, and, uh, which you can see here and here. Um, they also introduced domesticated animals like camels. Also cattle, which you can see in some of these images. Um, and of course, their pottery and their, uh, all their uh, agricultural objects means that uh, there was much higher rainfall that could sustain human populations in the desert. But that all changed about 10,000 years ago when the Sahara started to form as a result of, of um, many things that happened globally, including the rise of the Himalayas and uh, uh, changes in ocean circulation, etc which caused the climate to change drastically over the Sahara. So the first region I'm going to talk about is this very enigmatic structure called the Richard structure in Mauritania. 
So <clears throat> the Richard structure was first discovered by French geologists in the 1940s uh, when they mapped this in the, in, the, in the ground in Mauritania, which was then part of French West Africa. And um, this is where it's situated. You can see here the country of Mauritania. There's uh, Senegal uh, down here, and there's uh, Western Sahara to the north. And right here in the, in the part of the, the, the Adrar Plateau is this big structure which has been called the Eye of the Sahara. It looks like a giant eye poking out of the desert sands. Um, it's a really interesting structure, and it, was first, it first came to world attention with the Gemini missions in the 1960s when they took a well-publicized photograph of this uh, enigmatic structure, which led a NASA scientists to um, send an expedition there in 1969 to investigate this as a possible large meteorite impact structure, of which there are many examples uh, on Earth and also, of course, on all, all the other planets. Uh, however, this expedition in 1969 failed to find any evidence of, uh, of an impact. There was no, no brecciated rocks, no shatter cones, no shock metamorphism. So they concluded that this was some kind of feature that was formed internally. And this uh, has now been proven because uh, very recently a thesis was done by uh, Maton and, uh, under the supervision of Jebrak. And uh, they have found ample evidence that there is a big intrusion underneath here. Um, the, the host rocks here are Paleozoic sandstones, quartzites, alternating with shales. And this structure consists of alternating ridges of quartzite, and, uh, which stand out very proud as 100 meter high ridges surrounded by depressions where the softer shales have eroded away. But the ridges are all dipping outwardly like that. And so it, it, it has the impression that it's actually a dome that, ha that has pushed up like that and has produced a series of concentric circles. And the reason for these circles is simply desert erosion wind erosion that has eroded the softer shales away, leaving behind these ridges of, uh, of quartzite. And um, here we can see a radar image of the same. Uh, it's, uh, it's been used as a testing ground for all kinds of satellite uh, um, systems. And uh, you can see this is a very beautiful structure. It's 40 kilometers across in diameter. And, um, but the telltale signature it comes from aeromagnetics. When we do a magnetic signature of this, we see that there is a very strong magnetic signature here, a big ring, and there's a second ring here, and perhaps even a third one. And this is due to uh, mafic dikes. It's an intrusion. And it's, in fact, several uh, concentric intrusions, which are cone-shaped of, of dikes that are coming from a central focus underneath. And the recent work of Maton and Jebrak has shown that probably at depth there is a big pluton underneath which has intruded and has uplifted this whole region and uh, sent off these, uh, these dikes in these uh, concentric uh, uh, ring uh, intrusions. So that's the Richard structure. It's not enigmatic anymore. We now know its origin and it's uh, due to an intrusion and not an impact. Let's move on to the hand of Fatima which is in the Gulma Basin in Mali. And the first notice that anybody in the West had about this was from the great German explorer Heinrich Barth, who in 1858 uh, produced this very romantic, sort of almost gothic uh, type of uh, lithograph showing a moonlit scene at night with a lake. And notice there's a solitary heron right out here in the front, um, adding a touch of whimsy to this uh, fantastical image. Um, this region is in a part of uh, south-central Mali, where that circle is. It's a region called the Gurma Basin. Now, the Gurma is a, a set of sandstones and quartzites uh, which are basically flat-lying. And adjacent to that, this region here in color is a major orogenic belt that's part of the whole Pan-African uh, late Neoporozoic system of or or orogenic belts. And so this is where things slam together and um, this was a flat-lying sandstone system, and it got compressed. It's like uh, having a tablecloth, and you're just shif shuffling along one end of the table, and the tablecloth is sort of rippling ac uh, across. So the, 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 the outcrop patterns show very gentle folding, um, and it's somewhat very similar to the situation right behind us here 
Uh, in Cape Town, we have Table Mountain, and Table Mountain consists of flat-lying rocks of the Table Mountain Supergroup, of the Cape Supergroup, rather, and which apparently are flat-lying, but if you just go across the Cape Flats to the Hottentots Holland Mountains, and they're dipping away. So they're actually part of a fold belt, and then it becomes a whole Cape fold belt. So you just get the impression that it's flat-lying, but it has been folded. So that's exactly the same with the Gurma Basin. Imagine that this is Cape Town, and these would be the folded Cape, Cape Mountain Belt, and in fact, these rocks are exactly the same age as the ones here in Cape Town. So, <clears throat> um, what do they, these rocks look like? Well, this is part of the Sahel region, the transitional zone from the Sahara to the high rainfall region. And uh, this is the landscape of this area called the Hand of Fatima. And in the foreground, we see these huts, these grass huts, which are temporary inhabitations of the migratory herders uh, who live in this region called the Pearl. Now, they are found all over the, uh, the Sahel region in West Africa, and they have to move with their animals because this region cannot support fixed agriculture. They have to move with their herds of, uh, of uh, goats and uh, of cows or, or sheep, uh, which are adapted to, to desert conditions. There is sufficient rainfall here to support the animals, and the people are totally dependent on the animals. So this region used to be covered by an extensive sheet of sandstones, but because of this more recent uplift, it's on the flanks of one of these uplifts, it has been eroded away. And uh, with that erosion, you are left with a few remnants, similar to Table Mountain, by the way, which is also a, a remnant of a much more extensive sheet of sandstones. And here we find exactly the same thing. This is a sandstone sheet. It's now uh, a single uh, butte, uh, if you like. And it's called the Hombori Tondo. And this is the highest mountain in Mali. It has an elevation of 1155 uh, meters above sea level. And this is the famous group called the Hand of Fatima. And um, this is the iconic landscape of this region. Again, consisting uh, of uh, this granite sandst uh, the, these sandstones, which are overlying older, uh, older basement granites. And um, just to show you the comparison of uh, Bath's original lithograph and the reality on the ground. So it wasn't too far off, but more romanticized, but it's still a spectacular region to visit. And it is the iconic landscape of this region of Mali. It's been featured on the postage stamps, and it's called the Hand of Fatima because that's the Hamza. That's the, the, uh, uh, the hand of the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, Fatima, and it's a sacred symbol in several religions, actually, uh, in this part of the world. So the, uh, the actual hand of Farima, the fingers, if you like, uh, are some of the uh, most extensive and highest sandstone ramparts in the world. Uh, so um, it's a major attraction for, for climbers from all over the world who come to this area to practice their skills. And uh, in fact, in 20, 2004, a South African expedition went out there these are photographs from their expedition where they climbed these sheer faces of these sandstone ramparts. Okay, so the hand of Farima uh, is in this region which is uh, just on the flanks of one of these uplifts that I talked about earlier, and that is why you've got this kind of topography. So we move on to the actual uplift that it's on the flanks of, and that is the Hogar uh, region of the central Sahara, um, and the surrounding regions called the Tassilis, and Jebel Akakus, which is in, in Libya. So the re region we're talking about now, uh, we have moved from, um, originally we, was, we started here with the uh, Rishad structure, and then we moved to um, the region here with the hand of Fatima, and now we're moving on to this big uplift, this, uh, this region in the central Sahara. So I'm going to show the next slide will be a topographic view, obliquely looking from this direction, and you can see that here is the central Hogar, which is uh, in southern Algeria, and that's quite uplifted. The adjacent regions in Libya, which is the Jebel Akakus, is also part of this whole story. And you've got two adjacent regions, the Adrar de Ziforas in Mali and the Air Massif in Niger. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Hogar in Algeria. And um, this is a geological map of that region that's been uplifted, um, where the older basement rocks have now been uplifted and have been exposed by eroding away the cover sequence. The cover sandstones that used to overlie everything has now been eroded away, 
and you have now exposed the older basement, which is of this Pan-African orogeny that was deformed during uh, the ne Neoproterozoic amalgamation of the Gondwana supercontinent. So all of these rocks that are shown here with lots of faults that are striking north-south are high-grade metamorphic rocks and granitic rocks. They are basement crystalline rocks, and they are surrounded on all sides, that includes this gray to the south here, as well as um, all the regions, the gray that you see to the north. All of that is uh, the sandstones that used to cover the whole region, but now that they have been uplifted in the central part, those sandstones have been stripped away. All right, so here in the central part of the Hogar, you're seeing basement, but this basement has now been intruded by very young volcanics. Those are shown here in purple colors here. So the capital of this region is Taman Raset, which is the big town in southern Algeria, which is situated right here. And just to the north of Taman Raset is this vast, extensive region of young volcanic plugs. Now these were young volcanoes that uh, punched their way through this basement along major fault structures, and they produced very young volcanoes and volcanic plugs. But volcan volcanic rock is very soft and it erodes quite easily in the desert. So what's happened in this case is that all the young volcanics, tufts, and uh, pyroclastic rocks that came out have been stripped away by erosion. And what you're left with is just the, the actual plug in the center of the volcano, the, that is of hard volcanic rock that, that is now exposed to weathering as solid plugs which stand out as this iconic landscape that you see in the Sahara. So this kind of landscape is all of these are intrusions. These are all, they were all volcanoes at one stage. What you're looking at is now the core of this volcano that is uh, resisted weathering. So this is, uh, there's a famous monastery there that was built uh, in the early 20th century at Asikrem. Uh, and um, this is the view from that monastery uh, of this uh, iconic landscape. So these are old eroded volcanic pipes, and especially at sunset, it's a very spectacular uh, place to visit. So this region, this is called the Tijemain group of eroded phonolithic and trichitic plugs. Uh, some of them, you can see, they have got columnar jointing. This was the interior of the, of the volcanic intrusion and the exterior parts of the volcano have, have been eroded away. So these are now uh, standing out as these plugs intruding through the older basement. Now, when you go on the flanks of this Hogar uplift, to the north you have the Tassili Najer, and to the south we have the Tassili Nuagar. And that is the remnants of that extensive sandstone that had covered the whole region prior to the uplift. That sandstone is now the most amazing uh, 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 sort of view. This looks like one of the townships outside of Cape Town as you come into the airport. But this is uh, the, what is left of this extensive sandstone sheet that covers the basement and has been uh, fractured in two directions and then eroded along these fracture systems, leaving behind all of these as individual um, sort of uh, remnants of the sandstones. And when you visit them, uh, like here, this is what they look like. They look like sculptures in the desert, uh, quite remarkable things, um, all remnants of a much more extensive sand sheet that covered this region. And here we see uh, another example with thin, two spindly legs. Um, and uh, having studied mining geology, I wouldn't stand next to this for photographs like many other people who did. Um, one day it will soon, it will collapse. Um, here in Libya is another uh, continuation of the same sandstone units. You can see cross bedded sandstones. And this uh, is uh, very large for scale. This is uh, two people standing here. So it shows you how large this structure is. It's one of the largest natural arches in the world. Um, and uh, the way these things have formed is that they used to be a continuous sheet, which is show shown as TS on this diagram, which covered basement. The basement was this, this uh, G. Uh, which was gra granitic or metamorphic basement, and it used to be an extensive sheet covering the whole region. But because of the recent uplift, it has uplifted everything, stripped off the, um, in the uplifted area, the cover rocks the ba uh, have been stripped off, and you're left with this kind of uh, topography. So this topography is a result of this fairly recent geological uplift. And there are reasons for this uplift, in including uh, mantle circulation and, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming along uh, these uh, uh, pre-existing fractures in that basement. 
and producing a whole bunch of these intrusions uh, and these volcanic rocks uh, through this older basement. Okay, so let's move on to the adjacent area, uh, moving on now from uh, Algeria and Libya to Chad and Libya. So this is the most extensive volcanic region in the world that has not been studied properly. It is the largest extent of uh, young Cenozoic volcanics that have almost never been studied. There are, there are literally about three papers covering this entire region, which is probably as large as, um, I don't know, Iberia or something like that. Um, so uh, it's very remote. It's North Chad, and it's also a region that, uh, that's had civil war and other wars, including a war with Libya, uh, for the last few decades, and that is why it's more or less been off limits to most researchers for a very long time. So the region we're looking at is right in the northern part of Chad, so that's Libya to the north, Algeria to the, to the west, and uh, this extensive region here uh, is intruding through the cover sequences which are shown in these brown colors. This is the extensive sand sheet of Paleozoic age, um, and that's been stripped away and it's now being intruded by this huge volcanic province, which is extruded out onto the surface. To the south is the Chad Basin. So here is a simplified geological map showing uh, this sort of um, inverted L shape, if you like, of, this, uh, of, of the volcanics. There's a whole series of volcanoes. Each one of these circles is the big volcanic complex. <coughs> and it's surrounded by the Paleozoic sandstones which have been stripped away and intruded by this, um, uh, the, the, the volcanics. So here's the remnants of the surrounding sandstones that used to cover the whole region. And uh, they have the same kind of um, features as you saw in the Hogar, in the Tassilis, and so on. Now coming to the volcanoes themselves, we can see beautifully on satellite images the, uh, the different characteristics of uh, different volcanoes of different ages. So here we see a volcano, Tarso Tuside, and it is a huge caldera, and it's got a very s smooth surface around it of, made up of volcanic rocks. Compare that with uh, an older volcano, Tarso Abeki, which has been more eroded, and therefore has got much more undulating topography, more um, uh, eroded by rivers compared to the young volcano here with its caldera. Um, here is an example of a young volcano, um, with lava flows coming out. These are dark lava flows shown in sort of this purple color. And uh, this is the Pictuside, one of the very large volcanoes. There is another caldera over here with active uh, hydrothermal systems and a big salt lake that is formed uh, in, the, in the center of it. Um, we can see outcrops of columnar basalts and all kinds of volcanic rocks in this vast region. Um, this is that, that peak two or natron caldera which has uh, young resurgent volcanoes within the collapsed caldera. And around these salt lakes, you can see bubbling hot springs and young cinder cones, uh, et cetera. So it's a very volcanically active region, still bubbling away. Um, this is one of the largest of the volcanoes, Emikusi. That's a satellite view. That's an aerial photograph uh, taken by somebody flying over it. And these are digital elevation models, and that's the crater in the interior. So this is, again, um, you know, what, these are mainly satellite images, remote sensing images, because it's very, very poorly studied. It was first mapped by the French in the 1950s, and since then, only one person has really studied these, who was one of the original guys who mapped it, uh, Pierre Vincent, and uh, just uh, the recent paper by Parmentier and Oppenheim, which are the only papers about this entire volcanic region, uh, which is one of the most exciting regions in the world. Uh, and it also has a fantastic archive in these lake sediments of climate change over the last uh, several thousand years. Moving on from here, we move to the Enedi Massif of northeastern Chad, one of the most spectacular regions on Earth. Uh, it's got these herds of camels because it has some of the last remaining lakes in the Sahara. The lakes are fed by springs which are fed by uh, trapped uh, fossil groundwaters in these major Paleozoic sandstones. So on the edges of these sandstone bodies, from Mauritania to Morocco to other places, you find uh, oases in the desert. And those oases rely entirely on fossil waters 
that are more than 10,000 years old because they were last recharged when it last rained in the Sahara 10,000 years ago. So in this place, there is what is called a Guelta, which is a lake, a permanent lake, which has the last remnant populations of crocodiles. There are crocodiles in the middle of the Sahara, in the middle of, uh, because the only way they could have gotten there is that they were, if they were much more extensive across the whole of the Sahara. And um, there is uh, uh, this last remnant uh, Saharan crocodile living there. And this is one of the major watering holes for these huge herds of camels. So the region I'm talking about is on the northeastern corner of Chad, one of the most remote places in Africa. It is absolutely remote and pristine and very difficult to get to because the main capital uh, of, of the country is Jamena, which is down here, and it's a long way to get to, um, to the Enedi Massif, which is why it has been so little known and so little studied up to now. Uh, <clears throat> recently, a, an impact crater was found, this one here, Gwenifada, it's a circular structure that's proven to be a, a meteorite impact structure in this region. So, here we see another, another picture of that Guelta, the Arche Guelta. It's really spectacular. Um, and again, the, this region consists of the Paleozoic sandstones uh, on the flanks of the Tibesti Massif, which have been uplifted and eroded. And that's the, the remnant. Uh, uh, features that you see here are from the erosion of this once extensive uh, sandstone sheet which has been uh, affected by joints and the joints have, uh, have left behind this kind of uh, erosion there in uh, places where there's a uh, harder material covering softer sediment and that produces these mushroom shaped sort of rocks that you see here and these pillars. Um, so it's, it's again a major area that has got hundreds of peaks that have never been climbed before. It's a, it's a piece of paradise for mountaineers, and there's always the hardy types who'd get out there facing all kinds of dangers to get out to this area. And the, one of the major reasons is that it's the second largest arches in the world, the second highest arch in the world after Utah is this Alobi Arch. Um, it's on the cover of this book that uh, John pointed out, the uh, Africa's top geosites. And uh, I don't have a person for scale here, but a person who will be about this high. This is um, 220 meters high, the second largest arch in the world. And there are many, many arches, natural arches in this area. Um, and uh, there have been some recent uh, mountaineering expeditions uh, to this area by, from, from Britain. Uh, it's a spectacular place for first ascents and first uh, climbs and so on. So uh, it's one of the most extensive regions in the world of natural arches and has been very, very poorly studied. Okay, so I'll move on now to a very different kind of landscape, and that is the White Desert in Egypt. This is, again, it's a unique place on Earth because it has a unique combination of geology and climate and topography that has uh, uh, sculpted this particular landscape. So the region we are talking about is uh, lying to the south, southwest of Cairo, so that's Cairo on the, on the Nile River over here, and if you go south of Cairo, there's only one road. It takes you first to the Bahariya oasis, then to Farafra oasis, and then it ends up with uh, Dakhla and Kharga, and there's a road that takes you back along the Nile. So if you, if you go down south of, of, uh, of Cairo, you get into this region here, just north of the Farafra oasis. This is the great Libyan desert over here, and there's a whole series of, of dunes that are blowing in this direction, so the prevailing winds are blowing from the southeast towards the north, uh, from the southwest, sorry, um, southeast towards the northwest. And um, so here is a close up of that region, and you can see the trend of the dunes like that. So the winds are blowing in this direction. And the rocks here are very young rocks, they are Cretaceous rocks, they're part of the cover sequence, even overlying the Paleozoics that I've been talking about up to now, that cover the whole Sahara. Uh, when you go north of that on the whole northern Afri North African coastal plain from Morocco through Algeria and Tunisia and Libya and Egypt, you've got much younger rocks of Cretaceous and Paleocene and, and uh, Eocene age um, overlying them. And they're mainly consisting of carbonates and shales. So the Cretaceous rocks here 
uh, are made up of chalk, the same kinds of chalk that forms the famous cliffs of Dover uh, and the landscapes of, uh, of the, on the French coast. So that forms the lowermost stratum in this area, and they are overlain by a soft shale, a soft weathering shale, which is called the Esna shale that is shown in yellow colors over here. And the shale is overlain by a limestone called the Farafra limestone of Eocene age, same age as the rocks that, of which the pyramids are made up of, those nummulitic limestones. And these are much more resistant to weathering. So they form this, uh, this plateau that is shown in these blue colors. And the other softer rocks are being eroded away. And these winds are responsible for that erosion. And that has left behind some very spectacular landforms. So there is a remnant landscape here, which is similar to what you've seen in the other examples but that I've shown you. But the other examples are all of sandstone. In this case, this rock is limestone which is much softer, much more capable of erosion, but also it's white, it's spectacular, resplendent white uh, against a blue sky. Uh, it, it, it must call for some spectacular um, imagery. And of course, the best times to see this is, is at sunrise or sunset, when they you know, have this sort of glow in these rocks. So part of this is from the sunset, but there's also a natural color, coloration because the sand that blows, the wind, is, uh, is colored and it's eroding parts of this away. Things from the top, which is the limestone, which is more resistant to erosion, some of that breaks up into pieces and forms an apron around these pillars. Um, and uh, the different colors are due to the wind as well. So here we can see this kind of a landscape. It's formed when you've got rocks of different erosion um, uh, and resistance. So here is a soft uh, shale uh, overlain by a harder limestone. And uh, the wind, of course, is the strongest in its erosive powers close to the surface, because that's where most of the particles are blowing. And so the lower part of this outcrop is eroded away faster uh, than the more resistant cap and, and the upper part of the limestone. And that leaves behind these mushroom-shaped pedestals as a remnant of that landscape. Here is another in interesting structure called a yardang, which is sculpted by the wind. When, and, and they face into the wind direction, and the under, underside of this structure has been, has been eroded away faster, and therefore it leaves these projecting sort of uh, uh, um, structures uh, facing upwind. And um, you get very spect so they're, they're, they form uh, sort of st uh, structures that are parallel to the prevailing wind direction. Now, the, uh, this is a major tourist uh, area in Egypt. Uh, and uh, attracts lots of tourists, and uh, uh, of course, tourists want to be entertained by a resemblance to uh, things they recognize. So these features have been given various fanciful names, Aladdin, Aladdin's lamp, uh, the finger of God, uh, various other features um, have got names, and they're very popular uh, for tourists. But if you look around carefully on the desert floor, you can see remnants of the fossils that once were prevalent in these carbonate rocks including rocks, uh, fossils that had been converted from the, or the ordinary fossil and replaced by sulfides like marcosite. And then the marcosite has been pseudomorphed by iron oxide. So what you're seeing here is something like an iron, uh, iron oxide, like uh, girthite. Uh, girthite pseudomorphing a copper, uh, some shells, uh, spiral shells, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, mollusks. And in this case, uh, um, uh, a crystal of marcosite has been replaced by iron oxide. And then they've got a desert varnish, if you like, on top of them. They sit on the desert surface as the, um, young, uh, the more erodible things get washed away. So that's the, um, the white desert in, in Egypt, a unique landscape because of the, the conjunction of the prevailing winds and the geology. So I've uh, talked about the Sahara and the Sahel up to now, and I want to move on to another region, which is right down here, which is not quite part of the Sahara. It's actually geographically sort of should be part of the Sahel. In fact, it should be part of the, uh, the, the equatorial region of, uh, of uh, Africa in terms of where it's sit sitting in latitude. But because of the Rift Valley, it has been depressed down to below sea level, and it is a desert. And this is one of the most remarkable places uh, in the world, not just in Africa. So the area I'm going to talk about now is, is right here, where th um, the Arabian plate has, has uh, rifted away 
from the African plate opening up the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. And uh, down here is the end of the East African Rift System, uh, ending in this Y shape, which is where the tip of Arabia once used to belong. It's where Yemen is now. And this region has drifted away and should really be underneath the ocean, because this was originally floored by oceanic crust that had formed when um, this Arabia rifted away. But it is exposed on land below sea level. And this region is called the Danakil Depression. And it is the lowest point on the African continent. It is um, 120 meters below sea level. It's the second lowest point in this region, because the lowest is, of course, the Dead Sea, not far, far from here in Israel, Jordan, which goes down 400 meters below sea level. But in Africa, this is the hottest place. Uh, it's, in fact, the hottest inhabited place on Earth. And it should have been part of the, the ocean floor of the, of, the, uh, of the Red Sea, except that the Danakil uh, Alps rose up here as a horse block, cutting off this part of this basin from the rest of the world ocean, from the, uh, from the Red Sea, uh, and the entire ocean evaporated and dried up when, uh, when the, this region had been cut off from the ocean. The remnants of that ocean is a two kilometer thick salt layer that covers the whole of that region. So the entire uh, Danakil depression is, over, uh, is underlain by two kilometers of salt. So this is one of the largest salt deposits on Earth, and um, there's a major potash mining operation that is just starting up there. Now, aside from the fact that it's got this uh, incredible depression, it's also, because it's part of the seafloor, it's actually got seafloor volcanism, the kind of volcanism that happens when two plates spread apart at the bottom of the ocean, and it's happening right on land, and there are active volcanoes here, uh, and the, one of the most active volcanoes on Earth called Erta Ale. So this is Erta Ale, and it is one of four volcanoes on Earth that have a permanent lava lake that's exposed all the time. The other ones being uh, the famous Kilauea volcano in, in Hawaii, <coughs> Mount Niragongo in the Congo, <coughs> excuse me, and Mount Erebus in Antarctica. So Erta Ale is a remarkable volcano. It's, um, it's, been, it's been active, and it's always active because it's got this permanent lava lake. And at the one end of it, over here, is this large gaping hole, the entrance to hell. Uh, and on the surface of this lava lake, there is a crust, which is uh, where the, um, the lava has now uh, cooled uh, sufficiently to form a crust on the surface. But the crust is active because there's, there's active plate tectonics happening underneath. There are convection cells that are pulling the, 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 the plates apart and forming these kinds of ridges on the surface. And there are also complementary subduction zones uh, as well. So this is plate tectonics in miniature happening on the surface of this lava lake. It's a very spectacular place. Difficult to get to. It's a, it requires a seven-hour hike through 37 degrees heat. You carry four liters of water, and it's all gone by the time you get to, the, to, the, to this place. And you have to spend the night um, there as well. Our supplies were actually carried by, by camels. This is how you load on one of these camels. Uh, and we thought we were getting a ride, but we had to hike. Uh, <coughs> on the way, there are very spectacular lava flows that have come out from Erta Ale and the adjacent volcano. You see this beautiful ropey lavas, textures, pahoe hoe lavas. And eventually, when you reach the volcano, you descend down into this large caldera. And this lava here um, is, uh, is very, very young. It's, in fact, probably about two years old, because the lava lake over, over spills every now and then. So it fills up the entire uh, caldera with lava, and then it subsides again into that permanent uh, um, caldera. And uh, so these lavas that you walk over are very, very young, and they crunch underfoot. Now, we got there towards sunset, and there's the lower, low sun in the background, and the whole of, this, of the caldera is, is floored with this golden-colored material. It looks like, you know, soft grass. It is not. It is all volcanic. Every single bit of it, there's not a strand of vegetation in this. When you look at it closely, this is what it looks like. This is all that looks like grass, but it is volcanic 
rock that is formed when wind blows over newly formed still liquid uh, uh, lava and it spins it into these thin threads which in Hawaii are called Pele's hair. Pe Pele was the goddess of the Hawaiian volcano and so when the wind blows this into these fine threads it's called Pele's hair and that's a volcanological term that is used now for this kind of structure. So this is actually made of volcanic glass. Thin strands of glass formed naturally by the wind blowing across the surface. And so um, <clears throat> you can stand on the edge, but not too close, because you, because you can actually see there are fractures here. And if you stand too close, you would fall into this uh, tomb and wait for an agonizingly long time before you would, you would actually, anything would happen to you. Because one of our party took a water bottle and threw it in, onto the surface of this lake. And I would have imagined that it would have instantly melted. You know, it's plastic. Nothing happened to it. Nothing at all. It just stayed there, and um, the plate tectonics continued, and it rode with the plate, and, and nothing at all happened until it got subsumed under, in the subduction zone. And only then did it actually probably melt instantly. But um, some people are not so... Uh, uh, careful. Here is uh, Professor Jacques Varey, who was one of the French guys who first mapped this volcano in 1970. And uh, um, you can see he's standing perilously close to one of these, these fractures, and if this collapsed, then uh, that would have been his grave. Um, so here is the view of the lava lake uh, and uh, that, that permanent uh, gaping hole. So we, we saw this view, and then we climbed back up to the rim to have our dinner. And then after sunset, we descended back down into the crater to have a look at it at night. And it's very spectacular. It's, it's, it's incredibly spectacular to see this and to see these, this, this plate, these plates occurring. And, and they, when they rip apart, they just all of a sudden just form a whole new ridge. And it spreads across the whole thing and links up with other systems so that in places you can get a ridge ridge uh, transform system with three, three plates, three, three convection cells sort of combining with each other. And of course, the one thing about this that I cannot explain to you is the smell of it. The smell hits you long before you anything else. It's the very, very acrid smell. Uh, it's sulfurous fumes, uh, sulfuric acid, basically. And, and then the, you feel the heat. You feel the heat coming off this. It's like an open furnace. All the heat and the, and the acrid fumes, you have to cover your mouth. And um, that's a photograph that I took of uh, people looking at it from the, from the edge uh, at night. And these are very spectacular scenes of these. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a fireworks display at night. So, and it's always constantly changing. So it's very, very spectacular. I would recommend this to anybody uh, half your age. <laughs> <laughs> There were a few old people who came along on that trip, and they suffered terribly on that trip because it's, it requires uh, maybe a camel. <laughs> so that is what we really need. Um, <clears throat> and uh, well, we had to hike back the, the, the same uh, 10 kilometers or 12 kilometers the next morning when it was much cooler. But these are the kinds of huts that we spend the night in on the, on the edge of the caldera. Now, that's not all that you see here in the Danakil Depression. So this was Erta Ale Volcano. And I'm going to show you one more thing, and that is the Dalol region, which is really one of the most spectacular places on this planet. So the Dalol is part of the salt lake. It covers that two kilometer thick uh, of, uh, layer of salt. And all of this is salt. This is the, the proverbial biblical pillar of salt that Lot's wife turned into. Well, there's lots of pillars of salt everywhere uh, in this region. Um, and uh, this is quite spectacular because um, the coloration that you see of this very drab color is due to wind that blows volcanic sand over this area. But the salt itself is white. It's pristine white. And every year, there is rain that comes from the Ethiopian highlands where it rains, and the rivers come down the, the slopes of the escarpment and run over this whole plain and overrun the whole plain uh, as a, 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 a basically a lake. So the whole region becomes a lake just for a couple of months in the rainy season. 
because it's a desert, it dries out. The water's got nowhere to go, it's sort of sitting on top of salt, and when it dries out, it forms a new layer of salt, which is pristine and white. It looks like this. So this is the newly laid down salt. It's still glistening. It's still wet from the brine. Uh, that's that's the, what's become of the, the uh, um, rainwaters at the course over this region. And you can drive over it. It's got polygonal 